Hello! This is Faith at House Fraud Homestead, back with our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> I'm finally doing the uh, dome tour I keep teasing you guys about. Um, I will warn you in advance, it's not super aesthetic right now. Um, uh, we have some cardboard that's uh, gotten pulled up by the pig. This got knocked down a couple days ago. It's um, This is an imperfection learning curve kind of tour. So I have to come out and water. I figured this would be a good time to take everyone through um, where we are at the about six month mark of our growing dome, our 26 foot, in uh, Zone 5B in Colorado, and what I'm learning and um, what I've bumped into along the way, and hopefully help out some other folks who either have domes or um, um, are interested in domes or just gardening in general and troubleshooting. Um, I have my menagerie down here. Uh, Pepper just got spayed yesterday. We made that happen for her. And um, two of the chickens are laying again, so I will have an update on the critters um, probably in our next video. But yeah, I'll go ahead and take you around. Hopefully this isn't a terribly uh, motion sickness inducing tour here. So again, not super aesthetic in here either. We are still getting things going. So the way we set our beds up is with a center bed in the center that's going to be trees and perennials for the most part. We are waiting on a large fig to put in the middle um, because we need to figure out where the ladder is going to go because these vents up here have to be manually serviced um, twice a year and we need to make sure we can reach them. So if a big tree's in the middle, that might impede us. So that's how that's set up. And then we have a long perimeter bed over here for annuals. And this one, um, and by the, by the way, this is all oriented with this at the north side. Um, I'll, t I'll explain a bit of the mechanics of this in a moment. Um, that hose you see in the corner there, that is a climate battery kind of deal. It's all solar powered. It pumps um, climate controlled air from the tank to the south side of the bed to keep it cool in the summer. In the winter, you reverse the flow so that warm air from the south side gets pumped to the tank. Um, so that's that. It also comes with um, this heat sink pond here. Um, this is 1,200 gallons more or less for this size, and um, it has a solar-powered waterfall. I also just recently purchased a solar irrigation setup that will pump um, fish water, fertilizer water, out of this tank and um, also a solar aerator so we can get some fish going in there soon. I don't have fish in there yet, I haven't been brave enough. Um, again, this south wall reflective stuff is meant to repel heat in the summer by keeping the pond shaded. And then when the sun is lower on the horizon, it will reflect heat into the tank, which will radiate heat and keep it at a stable temperature. And we didn't even have the tank in in the winter, and I don't think it got below freezing in here without any heat sinks at all. So the climate control is pretty robust. It also has these neat um, beeswax powered hydraulics. So um, they automatically open and shut um, when the temperature melts the beeswax. So that is pretty neat. Same with um, these two vents over here. Um, those also automatically open and shut with beeswax. So there's just a lot of really neat things that went into this design, so that's why we purchased it. They're also based out of Colorado, so they're suited to our climate especially. They're hard to see right now. We also have these two um, solar-powered fans that are blowing air in and creating something of a um, cross-ventilation situation. You'll also notice, this, I guess this is the beginning of where we did things wrong. This is shade cloth here, and this has made a big difference. We were having some issues with things getting way too hot in the summer, and we put this up about halfway through. We did, however, because um, neither of us is um, overly comfortable with ladders, put it too low. It rightly ought to be following this um, in a V-shape and tucked up like from here and sitting higher up here. But uh, we chickened out, put it too low, so things are not doing as well as they could have. We're waiting until this crop finishes up in about a week or two, um, and then we will move this farther up. Um, having it this low also kind of screwed up my plans for a trellis. Um, I had originally, you can kind of see where the hubs are at this 
level here, they have eye hooks in them. And I was going to do a um, fishing line kind of spider web deal woven in here so that it's invisible when you don't have anything growing on it, but it'll also hold things up and be tucked away in the back. Um, so that didn't happen. So what we actually have for a trellis that has been having mixed results is this um, doggy playpen that our pig came with. And it works well because it um, leaves access to the vents, but it's not nearly tall enough, not going to be a permanent solution, so we'll be taking this out. And you'll also probably notice that the plants in here are a little bit underwhelming. Um, it has been scientifically unconfirmed, but we are pretty sure that the 10-ish um, cubic yards of soil we brought in were contaminated at least partially with some herbicide. So we've had nothing but problems with the soil and I, it was a whole rigmarole because when I first planted everything, everything, and this was in April after we just filled the beds with this new soil, everything was gorgeous, everything was sprouting, and then all of my bean seedlings curled up and died. All of my potatoes curled up and died. Um, my potato, my tomatoes curled up, and I'm like, this is very bizarre. And eventually I found this graphic online that showed um, the effects of grazon contamination and that it, the um, affected demographics of plants for that particular herbicide tend to be potatoes and tomatoes and beans and peas and legumes and things like that. And I've tried four sets of beans in here. I've had the same result every time. Um, I actually, you know, I put this eventually, this, this is a whole, this is a whole story, so you get comfy. Um, I asked multiple gardening groups and most of them confirmed from my pictures that yeah, it's probably herbicide contamination. There's probably like a tiny bit of grazon contamination in the compost that went into this purchased soil. Um, the, and you know, I kind of went off that. The, um, I contacted the soil company I got it from, and they very graciously appear, um, came out to check it. And they were blaming it on, and I, I don't know for a fact that this is untrue. I'm not accusing them of anything. They were very nice to show up. Um, they were saying that it's most likely too wet and too waterlogged, um, and that it needs to be mulched. So here's the thing with mulch. Um, I was told in the dome owners group on Facebook that mulching is counterindicated because um, you will get pill bugs in an insurmountable way because it doesn't freeze in here. So any pest you get will grow in numbers beyond your control and that mulch is not advised. And they've also had herbicide contamination from mulch. So I didn't mulch. Um, the other issue I've had with the soil, irrespective of any herbicides, is that it is a rock like it gets so compacted, it's very peat heavy. Um, if you miss a day of watering, it instantly gets hydrophobic and then you have to drench it. And it's just not a good time. So, um, and you can kind of see here for, for contrast, right around these little citrus trees is a uh, Fox Farm potting mix. I put them in little islands of more acidic soil and, because that's what they needed specifically. and. The difference is incredible. Like it doesn't get compacted. Um, I planted onions around each of these, um, you know, around the perimeter of this bed and also around the trees. And you'll notice that around the trees consistently has the biggest onions. So this soil over here was much better. Um, in the way of amendment, I have tried to work a tiny little bit of perlite in and that's helped a little bit. It's still not great condition. It feels really sandy. It dries out really fast. Um, but this has at least kept it from getting really, really compact. Um, but I just went to the um, customer appreciation day for the dome company. And there I learned that, yeah, mulch would probably help. So after all that, I'm actually going to put some mulch down. Probably garden straw, which is a safe, um, I think, confirmed herbicide-free um, straw that should help keep everything from drying out and compacting and all that stuff 
um because i have to overhead water and try and keep that balance and that's just hard to pull off but at least i can get my hands in here when there's some um perlites in the back it's just a rock so lesson learned there and i'm not <laughs> i can't remediate this fa uh, soil fast enough i was going to submit it for testing but it is three hundred dollars to um, get it tested at a university for this particular herbicide and I don't have that kind of money. I have been told if anyone else is running into this issue that if you um, just use it as a, as a um, variable in a little solo cup study and use some different kinds of soil and different conditions and just try some legume seeds in there like beans or peas or clover, that can give you a pretty good indication of whether you have um, herbicide contamination still. So if you have um, stuff curl within the first, I think, two or three sets of leaves, that's a good indication. I didn't bother with that because um, having three to four, I can't remember how many I did, sets of beans die in this soil, irrespective of light and heat and water, was enough confirmation for me. So I'm not trying to shut this company down or anything like that. I think this was just a one-off. We, we bought so much soil that it could well have been just a bad batch. Um, so I'm not too concerned about that. But nonetheless, if it is indeed grazon contamination, we, are, we can expect to have problems for years. So it'll be an ongoing journey to document how I remediate this, but whether it's herbicide contamination or not, the um, remediating factors are going to be the same. So I will be doing those. Um, I have some examples here of what's kind of bizarre, like the, the kind of Chernobyl growth. Um, this cucumber finally fell over and that's why it looks terrible, but you can see this is one cucumber stem that just mutated into this long sheet here. For reference, this is a normal cucumber stem. So something very bizarre happened there. Um, the potatoes and the beans, as I said, are gone now, but they had beautiful growth right here and then just shot up really tall, curled up and died. Um, same with the beans, shot up really tall, curled up and died. Um, the tomatoes, you can see, nightshades, and like, I know some of this is because they're, um, I can never tell if it's etoliated or etiolated or something like that, but they are leggy because there's too much shade cloth here. I fully comprehend that. I'm trying to find the parts where they just... They almost look like coral. Like there's weird mutations of growth on there where the growth end just stopped. Um, I can't seem to find them right now, but like things happen with these plants that I have never seen before and I have gardened poorly um, in many different conditions. So, um, and then some crops are unaffected. I'll go through those as well. But like even the tomatoes that are getting good light over here never really recovered like they're still they're still curled up they're still funky um so if there was herbicide contamination i think it was light it might have been like the the two year mark kind of thing this is another nightshade it's also curled up same soil same watering everything um yeah everything that uh the nasturtiums they were not on the list but these also same thing um, yeah, those tend to be what has been affected so far, and that, that all falls within the demographics that were um, brought up. So what I'm going to be doing to remediate this is A, the mulch, and B, I learned about um, something that the founder of the dome company does, which is basically composting um, cuttings from within the dome in place with worms. And I do have worms in this little tower over here, I'll show you guys in a minute. Oh, everything in here died too. That has also the same soil. And I put the same soil outside under mulch that wasn't getting watered like the guy recommended. And um, my flowers all curled up too. They haven't died, but they are extremely stunted. So if it's not herbicide, I think it's just extremely compact and the composition is not suited to what I'm doing. So something's got to give. So I'll be working with that. I'll be trying to remediate with either store-bought worm castings if I need to replant quickly or burying mulch in here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn these fans off so you can hear me a little bit better. It's a little bit loud in here. And yeah, you can see here this um, hasn't been doing great. Um, also got really bad, 
That'll be another part of the video, actually. I'll save that for later. Um, also had problems with that. So yeah, that's the state of the soil. Um, it's If it gets watered every other day, we can at least keep it from getting hydrophobic. Um, but once it gets hydrophobic, it is like not great. But like, this is supposed to be, this soil was supposed to be back guano and bone meal and um, like beautiful, beautiful stuff. It was 120, I think bucks per cubic yard. This was like twice the price of everything else because I was like, this is going to be an investment. Let's do it right. And it's not very impressive, quite frankly. <coughs> Pardon me. So yeah, I just, I regret getting this particular soil for this particular application. I don't know if mulching it would have made a huge difference um, considering things don't care to grow in it at all. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, Another th choice we made that I'm not going to call a mistake because it was on purpose is the Dome Company recommended putting a layer of um, landscape fabric under this and I am opposed to landscape fabric on principle. Um, it might be irrational but I just don't like the idea of a, bur a barrier or something synthetic between you know the earth and itself and I know this is a synthetic barrier between the earth and itself so that's hypocritical but we chose not to put landscape fabric down, and we could have, if we wanted to, put um, what, cardboard down, and didn't do that either. We have a um, very deep layer of um, hugel culture under here, so we have all the um, logs and um, slash from around our property under here. Um, something we have been dealing with is bindweed coming out of our ears. And that is a known problem here. You can see, you know, it's coming up over here too. We had um, water come in under the walls just because we haven't dug out a trench around it yet. And that took place. So, you know, bindweed is here. And what we're doing with it is just every day, snip it off at the top. And so far we haven't noticed any ill effects on the plants from it. So we're usually able to catch it before it does any damage. Some of them hide and get a little bit up in there, but we can usually just quickly pull those up. And I just leave them on top. I haven't noticed them rerouting, so they can just be green material. Um, so that is something we are dealing with. It's, it's just a Sisyphean effort. Um, I don't regret not putting landscape fabric down. Um, I'm told that eventually if you just keep persistently pulling at it, um, it will exhaust its up to nine foot root system and then you know you'll be home free and we are noticing that as other stuff grows in around it it does tend to get less robust so I'm not too worried about this it's just a light nuisance if we mulch it that'll also probably help um, so that's neither here nor there but if you are wildly opposed to any weeds whatsoever you'll probably want um, landscape fabric um, another thing we've been dealing with, and I think it's because, in part, of the stress that the plants are under from the soil conditions, whether they're herbicide or not, is pests. Um, we have an issue around the whole property with aphids, and um, getting those under control has been a production. Um, I first, at first I tried um, insecticidal soap, and not even insecticidal soap, just um, like Dr. Bronner's in both a spray bottle and a um, hose attachment. Um, I had a couple different issues with that. I found that it was very easy to overwater when I was doing it that way and that if I did not um, take the soap off within like um, 10 minutes during the day, so, so it was two different things. If I um, sprayed during the day and um, did not spray it off immediately, or even if I did, it would burn the leaves. And you can kind of see some some of that happening here. Um, so that was that was not ideal. I could spray it at night and then wash it off in the morning. That worked a little bit better, but not sustainably. It didn't really um, decrease the population. I also tried, I'll show you guys what this stuff is. Um, this was a disaster. This neem cake stuff was recommended to me um, as a way to kill most soft-bodied insects, um, fungus gnats, um, aphids, etc. 
I tried that very persistently, like every other day as a tea, in the soil, everything. And it not only did not help with the fungus gnats and the, um, uh, the aphids, it also introduced new bugs. So um, this little tower is a good example because um, I had put them pretty heavily in this top layer because um, my strawberries were getting infested with fungus gnats. And so I was watering that in, all that good stuff. And then new gnats I had never seen before came up from this. So I don't know if there were somehow um, like eggs in there or something, but I got the same thing happened on my house plants. It was just a disaster. So I have discontinued use of that entirely. I'm still trying to collect the last of the um, aphids that came out, or not aphids, the, the gnats that came out of there. Do not recommend that at all. It was, uh, made the problem worse. So another thing we've been dealing with, and this was pr probably partially on me for, um, importing plants at all. Um, you know, perennials, especially like if you want a specialty breed, um, I did not get seeds for absolutely everything with they, they do suggest, but I don't regret that necessarily. I have had a bit of a time with spider mites. They haven't killed anything yet, um, but you can kind of see, you know, evidence that they've been here. I think that they are under control. Like the, so far, the only impact I'm really seeing from them is aesthetic. Um, and I did try soap and water on those as well, and it worked. It works okay. The issue is that they are also on the pond plants, and I don't want to mess around with soap on the pond plants. Um, that's not going to be a good time. Um, you have to pull everything out and soap it and then rinse it re really, really, really good and then put it back. And I'm just, I don't care to do that. So what I've been doing that I've had the most success with so far is just inspecting. And I don't know if it's going to focus. Just inspecting in all the little crevices for webs. And just manually pulling those off or spraying them off with water. And if they are not, if they are... Too busy building webs are going to do less damage to the plants. I also tried predatory mites, and they are not a sustainable solution, I found, because to get them here and shipped is like 40 bucks per batch, and you're supposed to repeat every two weeks. And that I've done it twice. I think we're at the point of diminishing returns on those. So we're going to have to see what happens in the um, fall and winter when I don't have as ready hose access. But right now they are under control with just spraying them off. Um, if that changes, I will let you guys know. As for the aphids, um, another thing I'm doing, and it's not in the best shape right now, these little cups here are full of ant traps. And I have to reseed them. They're not um, active right now. But in those traps are cotton balls, and I'll, I'll, I'll link the, the recipe I found to the bait if I can. It's cotton balls and borax and um, water, and sugar water basically. Um, so it lures them in through these little holes on the side. I wish I had more aesthetic containers, but I don't right now. And then they carry that borax off to their queen. And that did help. If I keep up with it, it helps to keep the ant population down. And then they're not farming aphids. Um, they're, not, they're not super active right now, so I'm not too worried about it. What has made the biggest difference, and it did take a couple tries to establish them, is ladybugs. Um, this was all infested. It doesn't look great right now because it's um, past its prime. Um, these ground cherries were infested with aphids. And... The last batch of ladybugs, oh, you can see one here, fighting the good fight. Um, the first time I released them, it was probably too hot in here, and they all, within a day or two, just flew out the windows and were gone. So I got another batch um, after the shade cloth went up and after all the plants were a little bit more um, established, and I released them instead of over here, where they just went out the window. I released them over here this time, where it was... Um, nice and moist and jungly, and they have been breeding. Um, I have seen eggs in you know various stages of the life cycle. I don't know how many are still in here. I might do one more release before um, winter when they're more likely to stay put. But um, yeah, they have been much more successful so far in 
keeping the aphid population down. Um, for some reason, they don't like to hang out on this kale. They are much more successful in these beds. But um, I'm able to keep the kale mostly under control by just picking the bottom leaves and spraying um, with a strong blast of water when I see them. Um, again, soap was just not especially successful. I could also probably stand to thin these. Um, the successful domes I toured had stuff planted a little bit more, more um, farther apart, at least for the monocrops, so that you don't have things just, you know, carrying along. So that is the pest situation. Um, we've also had, like, black widows in here and beetles and crickets. Crickets love to kind of take over in that um, bag over there. So that's what's ha been happening there. Um, some things are doing well, like this ground cherry went gangbusters. Uh, basil is doing really well. Cucumbers have not produced, but they did get very big. And I, I think these are having a bit of a Chernobyl effect. So that's probably part of it. Um, tomatoes are producing, even though they look terrible. Um, so I'm just letting them do their thing. I don't know if they're ever going to recover. I'm probably going to cut them back after the season and not do tomatoes in here until the herbicide concern is abated. This bed so far is doing the best with perennials. Um, a lot of the herbs in here were originally outside and um, that was because they, they came in because we had Hurricane Pepper the pig come through and um, uproot a lot of them. So a lot of them are in here as like refugees. But like this is um, lime balm, lemon balm, um, and everything's just exploding in here. That's a comfrey, catnip, lemon catnip. If you haven't tried lemon catnip, it is the bomb diggity. It smells so good. Um, lemon verbena. Um, so anything that's going to be of more tender plants, I'm keeping closer to the, the pond here. Um, so, and then this is a Meyer lemon, that is a um, Beers lime, and then that is a uh, Satsuma right there. And I might need to, this is another mistake I might have made. Um, I put them in a little island of, um, you know, acidic potting mix. I think they need to be in a sandier substrate. Um, and I, I was told that with just this configuration, I'll probably drown them. Right now, they're not hurting that I can see. So as soon as they start to show signs of stress, I'm going to pull them out, probably put them in a terracotta pot with, um, kind of like that, with um, the correct soil for them, according to the Citrus Growing Facebook group, and then put the pot back in here. And then that way, if I have to evacuate them to outside or treat them or something, I can easily pull them up and I won't have to worry about the soil um, needing to am amend this whole thing. So I think that's going to be easier. I probably should have done that in the first place. Um, I just like the idea of them naturalizing in here, but I think that's a tall order considering I'm not um, uh, heating in the winter um, artificially. But um, we do have plans for that fig tree in here. Um, there's a eucalyptus back there. Um, those have all been doing well. Chard is my favorite. I grow that every year. Um, it's happy no matter where I put it. Um, so this has just been a reliable producer doing really well. Um, this is a Malabar spinach, and I don't think it's actually related to spinach. Um, got tons of um, anthocyanins here, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, in their berries. And, um, but yeah, it's basically a um, perennial tropical form of spinach, and it has been very happy in here since it got established. I'm going to have to make it very unhappy when I take this trellis out of here, and I might have to start over, because it's just completely... Um, on there now, but eventually it'll crawl up this wall um, when I have a better trellis system. Um, the little marigolds have been successful. One thing I will do next year for sure is plant flowers in front of these vents because I have noticed a dearth of pollinators. Um, we got wasps. We got wasps that made a nest up there, but we have not had real pollinators in any kind of way that could um, keep up with pollinating um, the cucumbers especially. Like the tomatoes are kind of self-pollinating because they're in front of the vents and that um, wind pollinates them pretty decently. Um, okra did pretty good. I keep, I'm new to growing okra and I think I've been waiting too long to harvest it. So it's not, we're not enjoying eating it as much as we could if I were keeping up with it better. This is one sweet potato from the grocery store and all of its brethren. Um, I have no idea if they're gonna form tubers 
um, cause I didn't have time this year to, um, grow slips and plant those. So I just put a sweet potato in the ground. I put several sweet potatoes in the ground. This is the only one that did anything and it did a lot. Like it is taking over the world and I didn't know they bloomed and they're lovely. So this was a good choice. I might actually put these in the center bed as a ground cover because I would prefer to have a ground cover over mulch as a rule. And this has been very effective at that. Um, the leaves are also edible. I've been enjoying them in salads um, and cooked. So this was a good choice, I think, even though it's kind of a space hog. I have no idea if we'll have tubers or not. I kind of suspect not with how um, compact the soil is, but um, that is a good choice. Um, also did some brassicas. I fully admit to having gotten overwhelmed and not kept up with harvesting these. Um, I think the cauliflower might still be salvageable. Um, in retrospect, I think I would have, um, it would have been a better choice to plant these in the fall. I might replant them closer to the south wall in the fall and see how that does, because we'll have fall crops in there. Um, and then these carrots are just okay. Um, I pulled a couple and they're small. It's too compact for them, I think, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, this tower, it just had, um, strawberries at the top. I think they've gotten to waterlogged. They had the bugs. They had spider mites too. Um, I'm inclined at this point to just take all of the soil out of here and start over with potting mix because it's just not going to do well. And I don't foresee it getting, um, less compact in this situation. This tower though is pretty neat. It has a vermicompost tower in the center. And so far I've been like harvesting that out of there. Um, this chicken feed bag here. Um, oh, sorry, my husband's outside. This chicken feed bag here I keep um, to add more bedding to the tower. So it's not very aesthetic right now at all. Um, don't mind that. Um, crickets do tend to live in there. Eventually, I think I'm going to try and farm mealworms in here for um, chicken food in the winter. Um, pond plants... There was concern that um, this iteration of pond liners was not fish safe PVC. So I have yet to put fish in here. Supposedly we're not in the affected demographic, but I, um, I'm waiting for there to be more of a cover of plant life on here. I also learned that I should be fertilizing the pond plants if I don't have fish with um, just a tea bag of llama or rabbit manure. So I'm going to do that and I think that'll help. Um, this also needs to be within, um, a couple inches of that, so I gotta fill this back up today. Um, uh, we have had one algae bloom finally, so that means that the nitrogen cycle is finally doing something. Um, but I'm still a little leery of adding fish just cause, um, the plants haven't been doing great. I think it's just for lack of nutrition more than anything, but, um, you know, once there's a sentient life form in there, I'm a little bit more leery of, um, just fucking around and finding out. Um, with these guys up here, um, I just kind of do this. This is a lemongrass, and I just kind of dip them. I will eventually make all this prettier. Um, right now we're just in the learning phase, and I have not had time to make it as decorative as I'd like to. This is cat grass for the cats, and I'll put back outside. This is taro, which is edible. Um, water lettuce, which is not edible. Do not eat that. And then I had some watercress in here. That is a um, water iris, which is kind of just lumping along. It got spider mites also. Um, this is kind of all the accoutrement I've been um, accumulating. I'm going to, I bought some fabric. I'm going to just put a bungee cord around the outside here and um, just hang a curtain from it and make this a little bit more aesthetic in the corner. Uh, eventually we'll have a seating area over here. This is... Um, uh, so we have trash can, and then this is, I don't know if I have anything going in it or not right now. No, I don't. Um, when I have compost tea, I'll just throw things in there, and it's kind of just, you know, plant life soup. So I think that's kind of the state of the fairs here as of the six-month mark. It has been a time. Um, I'm still not to a point where I particularly enjoy being out here in an oasis capacity, just because I know I'm going to have to fight soil and bugs. Um, I do think we are in a better place now than like in April, and I feel like I've learned more now that I can um, iterate on and be more successful. 
Um, we still are going to have a fight with the soil for a while, I'm sure. Still going to have a fight getting the bugs in balance. Um, we still want to put a better floor down. We haven't gotten to that yet, so um, the weeds will be weeded out eventually. Um, but I think it was a good investment. I think it'll really pay for itself in the winter when we're able to grow anything at all. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So, um, that's, that's kind of the state of affairs in here. Um, if you have any questions about this, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. I'm still new to this, but it's been a lesson in just, um, kind of playing around with things and seeing what works in this particular instance. Like if, the, the more I've tried to find answers, the more I just didn't things just didn't work. So I'm, I'm finding that I have to experiment in here on my own and see what works in my conditions. And that's what's um, been working so far. So not a huge harvest this year. Um, we've had enough out of here to um, keep us in greens and, you know, these herbs, which is nice. But it's going to be a minute before it starts um, really paying for itself and, you know, becoming a jungle and yielding in the way we need it to so um i do i will say that i wish i'd had lower expectations when i first started i wish um the learning curve for both building and maybe i'll do a separate video on building at some point because that was interesting but um the the company you know innocently enough i think tries to sell you on fairly immediate success and maybe some people have that that's not been our experience um and I don't fault them for that. Um, I think if we'd had better soil, we would have had more success. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We'll get there. It was just a slightly harder time getting started than I think some people have had. So that has been our experience. Um, let me know what you think. Let me know if you would get one of these. Um, it, let me know if you'd like to see a like um, review of building this. I don't have a ton of... I don't know how to edit yet, so I can't really show a lot of pictures, but maybe one day when I do know how to edit, I can do that. Um, and I will hope to be in contact soon. Bye.